Okay, awesome. I think that we are now live on YouTube with a 10 second delay. So thank you so much everybody for joining. Um, this is Cloud Native London, the June meetup, virtual meetup. We're going to start with a little bit of welcome and discussion, and we're going to do some live polling. So if you have your phone or your laptop close by, then please keep it to hand and please like join in some of the polls. And then at 7.15 UK time, we're going to have our first speaker who's going to talk about container security. And then the second speaker will be talking about deploying a Apache Cassandra on Kubernetes. And then we're going to have a special break where one of the attendees, Kuso, is going to play some acoustic guitar for us for 15 minutes. Um, and then our third talk of the night will be key steps on good quality for infrastructure code. And then we're going to finish at 9 p.m. UK time. Um, if you are on YouTube, watching this on YouTube or whatever, we have a Slack channel. You can go to this link, oishow.com slash cnl dash Slack to join our Slack channel. You can ask questions there or you can chat to other people who are in the cloud native Kubernetes space. And also we have a Twitter handle cloud native underscore Lun. So if this is the first time you've joined, then welcome. Cloud Native London is a strong, open, diverse developer community, and we talk and learn and share our experiences with Cloud Native, usually in London, but of course, we're everywhere today. In fact, I think two of our speakers are in Paris tonight, and one, the other one is also somewhere in Europe. So in fact, we're from all over the place tonight. A little bit about me, I'm the Director of Ecosystem at at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is the foundation that hosts Kubernetes, Prometheus, Envoy, and lots of other open source projects. Uh, my Twitter handle is Oi Cheryl, and yeah, you can follow me to hear things about that are happening around Cloud Native. Okay, time for a bit of live polling. So grab your phone or your laptop and go to this link oishowell.com slash p. So this is just a website. You don't need to download anything. This is what the page looks like. And you will put your name, or you can leave that empty if you want, and click Continue. And then we'll start the live polls. So we're going to do a couple of questions about you, and then a couple of questions about how you use Cloud Native. And I'd like our, to invite our speakers or anybody else who's on the Zoom or on chat to comment about the results as they come in. So once again, this is the link, oishell.com slash p. That redirects to this. This is a longer URL called polleverywhere.com. But if you forget this one, you can join it in a moment. So first question, is this your first time at Cloud Native London? Hold on, let's see if this will start. Okay, and let's try this one. Okay, let, let me just check. Nobody is actually seeing the live poll, right? Okay, let me try and s let me just check this is working. Okay, if this is, <sighs> let me give it one more go. Okay, bummer, I'm sorry, I don't think this is working. So. Instead, what you can do is you can put your answers in the chat or you can just speak up and say hello. So I'm going to just 
give people a chance to say hello. Actually, if you if this is the first time and you're on the Zoom channel, then you, it would be great if you can just say a few words, like introduce yourself and where you are. Okay, I've seen some first people, first timers, Basil, Gerard, Roger, some people coming from France. Okay. I'm going to keep going on this. So I was based in North London, probably quite close to where I am. I'm in Camden. Camden is about here on this map. Usually I would do it. Um, usually this would be live, so you could just put in where you are. Oh, people from Iran and Hamburg, Essex. Very cool. Very cool. And I'd also like to ask, what's your job title? So there's some options like architect, application developer, what's maybe the closest to what you're doing right now? People from Ilford, Reading, backend developer, backend developer, solution architects, backend developer, DevOps, SRE, full stack, um, our developer advocate, cloud consulting engineer. Cool. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to go to the questions about what you're doing. So each one of these are kind of around one of the topics that people are going to talk about tonight. So the first question will be around container security, second one's going to be about Cassandra, and then the third one's about just infrastructure. Okay. So are you using any of these security products? So these are all CNCF projects, but there's lots of other ones like tools from Aqua or Twistlock or you know, uh, Palo Alto Networks, any of the above, Prisma. Yeah, Prisma is. Yeah, okay, Ashley. Of course, I've got to. I, I feel like I actually works at Twistlock, so I feel, or sorry, it's not Twistlock anymore. Now it's um, part of Palo Alto, right? Palo Alto Networks. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, not surprising that Ashley works, uh, uh, is naming uh, Prisma Cloud Compute, yeah, OPA, Aquasec. Cool, cool. I guess not many other. People, although there were some people who said that they're security engineers. So if you're one of the security engineers who um, put your name in, then I'd be very curious to see what sort of things you use. Okay, so this question is, um, is asking about your experience with Cassandra. And this relates to Cedric's, Cedric's talk. So um, questions, has anybody used Cassandra or what's your experience with it? Have you heard about it? Have you tried it? And feel free to like open the chat and, or open the audio as well and say whether you've used it. Yeah, I've seen some people saying they read about it, but they've never used it. They know the concepts, but never used it. Sorry. Okay, quite a few people saying they haven't used it. Yeah, but that's neat because in the beginning, I will give an introduction to say what are the good use cases for Cassandra. So that was the purpose of the question. Awesome. So I think there's one person who said that they've used it a few years ago. That's Kuzro. I think everybody else so far is saying they haven't used, haven't used it. Hopefully after the talk, they will be willing to start using or testing at least. 
that would be great. Okay. And then, so this question, I'm going to um, ask people to talk about how they how they use or how they view Terraform tests. So, have people used Terraform tests before? Have they used them for unit testing, integration testing, something else? Nobody's doing it. Hello? Who do test anyway? <laughs> well, we should be testing, right? Hello? Aha, okay. uh -huh, I think we have our first speaker. Yes, yes, yes. Good to see that. Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, uh, there is this. Um, I, I'm going to try to put the camera on everything, but it's, it's going to be a little, a little bit like a mess. Can I join with another device that I can use as a camera only? Um, sure. Yeah, whatever works. Um, note that we are live on YouTube at the moment, so you can figure out if you can sort of figure out how to join on your side and then um, oh, if it needs to be, we can swap the order of the speakers around. If we are live on YouTube, let me go. Yeah, we're live on YouTube. YouTube. No tabs, no, okay. no stuff coming through. Make sure that there is, I'm not safe. So this is what happens with the confinement. Uh, I don't know if you're watching the chat. Kai is saying, put on some clothes. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I'm, I'm not seeing the video right now because I'm screen sharing, so I cannot comment. Um, would you suggest do we watch the chat over here or watch the chat on YouTube then? <laughs> uh, what I feel <laughs> like. I can see Kai there. <laughs> um, I bet that YouTube would be probably totally different. <laughs> um, this is how you know that this is a meetup and totally not a formal conference. Uh, uh, yeah. Just if you're watching from YouTube, the Zoom chat is full of people going, oh my God, Jesus, put on some clothes, put on some clothes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so what were we talking about? We were talking about Terraform testing. So <laughs> some people were saying that uh, they've used Terraform for infrastructure, but not for tests. Uh, seems pretty, pretty common. Yeah, just people using using Terraform, but not for tests. Um, Stefan, do you want to? Is that what you expected? Or? Yeah, everybody's talking about it, but nobody's doing it. So that's why there is a talk about it tonight. So you can learn some four or five tools and practices tonight, hopefully. OK. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'm sorry that the live polling didn't seem to work tonight. We'll figure that out for next time, because usually this is quite fun to be able to see how people vote. So apologies that that's not working this evening. Uh, we've got a couple of sponsors for tonight, so I'm going to invite people to say just about a minute about what they are, but I want to say thank you again to these sponsors. So first one, Technovo. Uh, hi everyone, um, I hope you're all well. Uh, I'm Megan and I'm Community Advocate at Technovo. Technovo is a digital transformation consultancy providing expert partnership and growth without creating dependencies or disrupting culture. Community is truly at the heart of everything we do, which is why we're proud to sponsor Cloud Native London. There are two ways in which you can find out more about us, either DM me on the Cloud Native Slack channel, my handle is my name, or you can follow our LinkedIn page where we post our latest updates, blog posts and the like. Uh, I also look after one of Technovo's community initiatives, Meetup Mates. Meetup Mates is proudly partnered with Cloud Native London. The idea behind the initiative is simple. No one should feel like they can't attend the events they're interested in simply because they have no one to go with. Given we're in strange times, community is now more important than ever. Our Slack channel is where like-minded devs can come together, discuss the latest virtual events happening and discuss what they've learned. 
you can find out more information about us on meetup-mates.com where you can also sign up uh, remember meetups are better with mates and that is all from me thank you cheryl cool thank you megan um cedric do you want to talk about data stacks yeah, sure. So Telestax is the company that have built most of the Apache Cassandra database and provide an enterprise distribution of Cassandra, but also support for open source Cassandra now, starting from last December. Uh, we provide uh, support for any, any kind of Cassandra database. We provide tools and consulting uh, around it. And today I will present you how to run the OSS Cassandra on Kube. Cool, thank you very much. Looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, do we have anyone from Humio on the line tonight? Okay, I guess not. Um, X Matters. Okay, also not. Um, Anurag, you're doing the intro for Intel. Okay. Over to you. Hi, I'm Anurag. I'm Anurag. I work on uh, OpenNest. This is an open platform uh, for edge native uh, cloud infrastructure uh, at the edge of the telecom network, really. So it's, it's a mobile or multi access edge computing, as they call it. And how do we enable cloud native applications to be deployed at the edge of telecom infrastructure? That's a very exciting. A lot of excitement, probably, you guys are already tracking all the big cloud players moving into that space, all the acquisitions happening. So that's, that's where we see a lot of excitement happening. Key use cases like visual intelligence, artificial intelligence. These are, you know, how do you solve that latency problem? How do you bring your applications closest to the user so that they get the maximum out of it is uh, AR, VR, AI, and then how do Okay, I think that the audio is dropped out. So, okay, thank you, Anurag, for the for the introduction. Sorry, we couldn't hear the end of it, but um, maybe you can put it in the chat window for people to read later. And after the meetup as well, I'll send out more information. Um, we'd love for you to get involved as well. So. Uh, in any way, shape or form, Kuzo is has volunteered at the last minute to do a guitar, sh share guitar playing with us during the break. So that is awesome. And I'm really looking forward to that. But if you want to come and speak, then again, his website from my, uh, for oshell.com slash cloud native lung, you can sign up. Our next speaking slots are in early 2021. So you can sign up and hopefully by that point, we'll be back to meeting face to face and enjoying pizza together. Um, yeah, you can also sponsor events, join Slack group or catch up on the past videos from our previous meetups. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand over to our first talk of the evening. So I will stop sharing my screen and Jesus, are you on the line? Um, just give me a second, then I just uh, close the uh, the activity in the computer to make sure that there's nothing open going around. So I have no interference interference in the uh, in the talk, and I will be fine. There's plenty of tools that are open. I will be with you. I think that that is actually everything that should be open. So yeah, I think uh, that should be uh, the case. If my computer is responding, yes. Uh, so give me a second. I'm gonna try to put the camera now that everybody is live on camera. Are you having trouble sharing your screen or? 
now i'm just putting the video okay so i should be actually appearing yes here i am so it's not the most ideal screen uh, camera sharing i think it's much better like this okay so uh do you give me do you give me the control of the screen yeah yeah, yeah. you go ahead and share okay so here we are so i'm actually sharing the app and that should be fine okay so is everybody getting the slide or everybody's getting the two screens now everybody's getting the two screens so now should be okay yes so first thing there is a question going on here no i don't see the question so i will leave it so i'm gonna start it's okay yeah i'll watch the chat i'll let you know if there are any questions that come in perfect if there is any question you can ask him to me the sound is perfect i don't need to put the mix on no good everything's good you go for it it's okay so thank you very much for the uh, opportunity at the last minute uh i'm Francisco Scolar. uh i run the company called accelerates for uh, cybersecurity solutions of the next generation. The uh, purpose of this talk is to discuss an advanced view on the container ecosystem uh, security from a security point of view, totally out of the code, out of all the conversations that we ever had about uh, coding, DevOps, etc. It's about security and how do we take the security from our existing environment and our existing uh, solutions and frameworks that we have and we bring it into the container ecosystem to help people understand what can be achieved with the uh, solutions that we have today. So, first thing to, to talk about is to understand that over the years, mostly over the decades, we had a change in infrastructure. So we started having physical servers with different solutions as operating system and flavors, and we moved across the ladder of virtualizing the platforms and then uh, creating virtual servers and moving to the cloud and having uh, a lot of players providing uh, strong uh, solutions that would uh, alleviate the cost of our infrastructure. And then, somebody starting many many years ago thought about the idea of how can we make even a platform better use less resources provide the same result and even bring more and this is how containers were invented and containers have been here since a long time as i made a few talks in the past explaining the origins and how they were implemented and basically uh, they were the point where we started saying we can use more and do more with them. And eventually, obviously, somebody came with the idea of, can we remove containers also? Can we do something better? Well, we can go serverless. But we are going to stop our talk in the container side. So I'm very happy to have run my life over physical, virtual, and cloud. And a few years from now, a few years since, a few years back, in the container ecosystem, I'm not a developer, I'm somebody who wants to bring what he knows about cyber into the environments that I get my hands on, in that case, containers. So, obviously, you know this. What is a container? For the people who are just getting the first touch, even if there's people who know it, think about cybersecurity. Do not think about DevOps. Do not think, I know this. Of course, I know you know this. Otherwise, I wouldn't put the slide there. Of course, you know it. The key element here is to understand what are the underlying elements in a container ecosystem that makes the paradigm of cybersecurity change completely. The first thing is that we are sharing everything. So we are not longer making uh, compartmentalized uh, elements as uh, in this case, or uh, virtual machines. We are sharing all the resources of the container engine across the different containers that we're executing, which means what you do wrong is what harm me. So if you do something wrong in the platform, you're actually harming me because I may run my services against the uh, against the same platform, the same platform, but do it in a secure way. And you may be belligerent 
and put me at risk. Why containers? Because we get into DevOps. When we get into DevOps, we have the CI CD pipeline. And therefore, we need to think about how are we going to secure all, all these cycles from building, coding, building, testing, plan, releasing, deploying, operate, sorry, operating, monitoring, and planning, and going back to coding. In these different steps, I'm going to end up having access to resources. In that case, my containers, the container infrastructure. Think cybersecurity. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know the code that you're doing. I know that you're running a platform. When I think about cybersecurity in the days of today, I have to think about 10 years ago, what, what was the thing that worried me in 2010? What worried me was spam, getting an attack via spam, getting an attack via a particular, um, a particular uh, content in a mail getting uh, some malware via USB. Today, my worries are about the fact that I don't have a controlling infrastructure. Sometimes when I see customers, they tell me, oh, we got a virtualized environment. And then, well, we have the cloud also. Oh, you know what? Uh, 300 guys in the department are running containers. And I'm saying, you're evolving the infrastructure and you've got in no control of the security. Who is securing the containers in the backend? Well, I don't know. Well, and what are you doing with the container ecosystem? Well, we're deploying apps at very high speed. And who is securing these apps? Who's looking into the code? Who's actually looking into the behavior of the apps? Nobody. And threats are getting very sophisticated. So we have the technical dynamics of what are the new security conditions, especially with challenges that happened with the COVID-19 that we had to deliver without being present, without having the ability to talk and see the people, with the fact that we had to receive resources without even uh, checking those resources because there was no time to check. Everybody had to be at home and continue the business. And the pain that we get from the users that are running this platform is the fact that they have to continuous audit the security the continuous audit for security, the platforms that they have with the cost behind human and financial, they have to ask, actually also to make sure that the platforms that they put for security are not impacting their performance. And especially when they don't know even how, how the solutions are going to behave in different hybrid clouds. And then they don't have enough people, as simple as that. So they need to simplify the security side of the business. When we are running an ecosystem, especially a DevOps slash container ecosystem, most of the time, if we don't own the whole infrastructure, we are in a shared environment. When you are in a shared environment, everything below the line, the dotted line, is not your responsibility. Everything above is what you consume, and this is where you are responsible for the data, for the network traffic, for the, the security behind. And if you read the Amazon, Google, or uh, the Microsoft uh, terms and conditions, it tells you very clearly, we don't care about what you do. If you do something wrong, it's on you, it's not on us. Now that we have seen a little bit, an overview on where are we with the container ecosystem and what we're doing with and what are the security responsibilities, let's talk about how do we secure them then? So one of the things that come into play is to discuss, am I securing the container engine, the host, Am I securing the applications running, the images, uh, the permissions I give uh, to, the, to the platform, the framework itself, the users that are accessing the resources, the consumer that are behind it, everybody, nobody? Do I, do I come from, um, con, from a Docker slash Kubernetes as an example point of view and I start thinking, okay, if I use the best practices from Docker, am I okay? The answer is no. If I use the Kubernetes best practices from the security point of view, am I secure? No, it's not true. Everybody's doing it today and everybody's getting hacked when they are in behind container platforms. So the first part of the paradigm about containers is the fact that we are running on top of an OS. Whether we like it or not, developers don't see that. They only see pipelines and tools they use and management see results, applications being deployed, but in the back end, there is an infrastructure and therefore the apps and the OSs, okay, are actually vulnerable. We are sharing resources when we deploy containers and we have a fact of multi-tenancy and multi-user responsibilities. We have a problem also of how do we package, uh, how, what sources, uh, what packages we get from which sources. 
Do I think about vulnerabilities? Do I look about patching? Do I look about analyzing my, vulnerabil my vulnerabilities? Um, how do I find uh, who is accountable for what? If somebody starts developing a, an app with certain libraries, who gave the permission? Accessibility, who has access to it? Who is actually doing the firewalling and the traffic management? No, we don't know. It, it's a lot of responsibilities there. And at some point, either you control all of them or you start looking into next generations cybersecurity solutions to help you mitigate and reduce the surface attack, the attack surface, airbag as a role-based access control. The second part of the paradigm that we face with containers is the fact that the management and the high-level uh, people in these organizations are actually looking into the fact of we need uh, secure coding and also I need also uh, that the uh, code that, that I'm executed is at runtime and it needs to be totally um, uh, effective and performing. Uh, I also need, for example, Rust-C. So I need actually to see the fact that I have uh, real-time uh, applications being protected when they're running, API, APIs, and what's the security behind it? And then the continuous integration and continuous delivery, all the gaps in the middle, the tools that we use, do we secure Jenkins? Who is securing Jenkins? Who is implementing Jenkins? Who is the guy who did implement Jenkins? Where it is? So we have all of these problems because we went from a monolithic solution, okay, to a modular solution. As I said before, we went from a mindset of we built everything in a single block to a, a, an environment now where a lot of people build different uh, moving parts of the same solution. The third part of, this, of the paradigm about the security on containers is the fact that we went, as I said, uh, from that uh, monolithic uh, thinking to a modular block building an application that is container, container, containerized. And therefore, the security innovation is very slow because we cannot get to the same uh, environments with the same type of uh, security as fast as we want. The amount of coding and the speed of it is growing very fast. New techniques get into place. So we are having difficulties uh, identifying them and finding the gaps. The controls that we can use in virtual machines and physical servers, even in the cloud, they don't apply anymore to the container ecosystem. We need to change, we need to change the framework. We have a lot of new elements like processes not being controlled, um, creating unsecure code because we don't check it. And the adoption is getting crazy. We have a lot of adoptions in microservices and containers. But we are getting to the point where we have improper security solutions. If we have an example of Docker and we look into a Docker architecture, we look into the fact that depending on where we're sitting, we need to put different type of uh, security solutions into place. For example, if it's on the host, we need to put an anti-malware. And uh, we also need to filter the URL communications with web reputation. We need also to filter the IPF and firewall. We need to check for integrity. We need to also check for logs in different uh, libraries and applications running in the host that may report that uh, there is something that could be that could be flagged as suspicious. When it comes to the uh, containers themselves, we need to look into the IPS and the firewalling, filtering for vulnerabilities. We need to check into the integrity of the files and we need to be able to dynamically check the containers during the runtime to make sure that there's no malicious activity happening and malicious processes. When I have APIs, we need to do API security. We need to authenticate, check the authentication in the APIs and control the access to the APIs. When I have the registry, I need to make sure that the images are actually, they are uh, what the images say they are. And there is no, uh, I retain the immutability of the images. So the images don't change. Also, I need to control the credential access to the, to the Docker architecture. I need to make sure that only certain IP addresses and certain hosts can access the, this uh, particular host. And I need to check in the images if there are vulnerabilities. That is at rest because they are sitting there. I need to make sure that they have no vulnerabilities, that they are not being uh, tampered with, they are not being modified. But then we get to one of the slides that I love, which is a slide about some of the complex uh, securities that we get uh, to have in uh, containers. These are some examples of the available uh, threats that we can find today in our container environments. And the only way to fix those threats, don't tell me about best practices and whatsoever, you don't get to fix them with that. You need to actually use next-gen solutions. For example, fourth bombs. 
inside containers. So I can actually just launch a, um, a, a set of code inside a container that will just create a limited number of processes until it, get, it exhausts the capacity of the container itself and kills it. And I can keep on doing it. Communication between linked containers, that's called lateral movement. In the, um, in the definition from uh, an attack, an advanced pers persistent threat attack, one of the uh, elements or one of the steps is the lateral movement. When I go from one machine to another machine to continue spreading my vicious attack to other machines and, and establishing a strong foothold. In that case, I can actually uh, have that attack. I have also the unauthorized fiber traffic, which is basically uh, traffic that should not happen, be happening between containers. Rock images, my images that should not be in my environment and they appear there or that they appear in registries and then eventually I download them and use them without my knowledge. Orphan images, images that are there but nobody, for, people forgot about them and they just remain there either running or just uh, residing. Also, don't tell me that it's not, this is not possible because one customer, which is running 250,000 employees in the military environment, I did a project with them and it happened that he told me, when I asked for a server, they told me, we don't know where it is. We haven't, we haven't had a clue since a long time where it is. And I'm like, you know that server is, is, is I'm, I'm just gonna tell it very clearly, is this is not a critical server. This is a server that if you lose it, we're gonna have to start from scratch, really like from the bottom of the ladder. And I was like, well, we don't know where it is. And I was like, you cannot tell me that. I mean, I mean, I'm external. You don't tell me that. You tell it internally, you talk between yourselves, but you tell me we're looking into it. And then one day you bring a new one and say, don't use the new one. So rogue uh, orphan images, totally, total, totally possible. Rogue processes, processes I, I don't know that they're running there, and you're going to have a beautiful example now. Persistent volume mount, storage that I mount in containers, which I for, I mounted for the time of the execution and the time of the processes, and then I forget to mount them, and they remain there. And some, don't, some of these uh, elements, if you don't plan them and you don't prepare them, they are real, real threat. Crypto jacking, crypto jacking container host, one of the things that happens when somebody vulnerates an environment, a container, a container environment, and a container uh, environment in a company, is that they try to actually install crypto jacking because crypto jacking because this is the idea doing um, coin mining, mm. advanced persistent threats, infection that remain persistent, uh, command and control communications, which is basically uh, containers talking back to botnet. You being uh, considered as botnet, part of a botnet, and talking back. Uh, calling back home and communicating back to the command and control servers. And fileless attacks, this is something that it's going to come. The only thing that is saving the containers today about fileless attack is the fact that in order to execute a fileless attack, which is basically an attack that does not create anything in a disk, in a, it doesn't create any file, which is the worst attack today in terms of threats that we have. The only thing that's saving you is that as per today, there's been not a real example of executing something in memory without copying uh, a content in the disk, but it's going to come. And I will be the first one to present you that. Are you ready for the example? I hope so, because it's beautiful. I hope that you can read um, the uh, kissing, kissing malware attack. This is a capture screen from Aqua, which is a very interesting company protecting creating solutions to protect containers. So if you see here, and I hope that you can see my mouse, okay, the beautiful thing is that the attacker connects to an open API port. Wow, did I talk about securing APIs? Did I say something about that? So the first thing is just goes through the API, then jumps into the Docker daemon, runs a container, okay? The container downloads a shell script from a malicious IP address. URL filtering, IP filtering. Where it is my IP filtering? Comes in. The container runs the shell script. And what it does? It becomes persistent by adding a cron tag. So it becomes continuously persistent in the container. Next thing, 
it downloads the Kinsen malware from the IPs. Fantastic. Now I am not only vulnerated, but infected. I run the malware. And now I am in the Kinsey malware. Now I'm running, now I'm really in deep shit. Sorry about the language, okay? But now I'm really in the bad situation. Because the next thing, the next thing that happens is that it runs, okay, the malware and it stays persistent. And also it downloads a lateral movement script, which means that not only being happy about infecting um, a container, it goes, okay, and starts finding the uh, a script to actually find what are going to be the next machines that, and the next containers I'm going to infect. And not being happy about that, it just decides that it's going to run a crypto miner because, hey, resources are there to be used. So it runs the crypto miner and then starts communicating back home with command and control. Did I talk about blocking botnets and command and control communications? So it keeps on going to these IP addresses, runs the shell script about lateral movement, okay, and starts looking uh, to discover credentials and keys for other uh, containers and start spreading across the different uh, the different machine in your infrastructure. It's really, really a disaster. It's a disaster. So that's why when people tell me we do security in containers, we are following the best practices. And I'm like, okay, yes, but what are you doing about that? Because the best practices are, are actually doing nothing for this, absolutely nothing. Let's see this beautiful slide. This beautiful slide is something that is becoming a buzzword at the moment, which is basically how the uh, previous slide that we see here about the attack is matching the actual Mitre attack uh, mapping. So the Mitre attack has a set of sequences, initial access, execution, persistence, defense evasion, trying not to be detected, credential discovery uh, and access, discovery of all possible resources and uh, exit local uh, and uh, remote systems, lateral movement, moving, C and C, and then obviously the impact, which is basically extracting data and trying to exfiltrate the data. So if you look, if you go to attack Mitre, that all, basically it's just, uh, for us, it's just a framework. It's a foundation framework that we use to understand attacks. I recommend you to all of you to get a proper understanding of the Mitre attack framework because it's, um, it's basically um, the buzzword today and in the next three years everybody is taking all the security products and making sure that they are Mitre attack compliant. Let's see some solutions that we can use uh, in open source. I cannot talk about commercial solutions. We can talk about that in the questions or if the um, uh, Basically, uh, if you look at, uh, if, if we have, if you have questions about commercial stuff, I need the organizers to say yes or no. So let's look into a new vector, for example, providing one sys benchmark to basically define what type of misconfigurations you have in your uh, images. Okay, basically when you run that, you can obtain uh, some examples of warnings or uh, passes that uh, define what is actually approved or not approved. That's one open solution. Another one is, and I uh, missed uh, to add more solutions from Aqua in open source. Aqua has open source. The Kube Bench, for example, is very nice because it does exactly the same thing as the previous one, but just from Aqua. So uh, it's a very interesting tool. I will be more uh, happy later on to talk about others in uh, just by, by chat, other possibilities. Then uh, it has just vulnerabilities, but misconfigurations and vulnerabilities. Then we get player which is basically a static analysis uh, for um, containers on vulnerabilities, but it's actually static. So you just do the analysis statically into the uh, containers. Let's have a look into something more complex as a solution. Let's talk about Anchor. Anchor has an open source solution. All of those have a commercial solution. Anchor has a very interesting open source solution that actually looks into the image inspection, the image analysis, and policy evaluation, which basically defines with, you define with Anchor, what can be actually implemented uh, as a container and deployed and what cannot. It's a very nice tool. It's a really, very nice tool. And that part also is um, an actual open source tool. 
And then you have one of the ones I like a lot the most, Sysdig, which I know that somebody wrote me in the actual form uh, telling me that uh, they were using this Sysdig. Sysdig is pretty cool. And uh, actually they have a lot of tools and a lot of integrations with Prometheus, for example, uh, to uh, enhance monitoring. But for us, what is important is uh, Falco and Inspect, because both of them, they're looking to uh, CVEs, so clinical vulnerability exploits, uh, scanning and visualizing the images, uh, making sure that it behaves, uh, the solution behaves as an IDS, intrusion detection system, and it stops, uh, it stops actually uh, the uh, surface attack by providing you a way to prevent uh, vulnerable images from being used. Same thing happens also with Aqua. But I like this thing uh, a lot, like I like a lot Aqua, because their, their products are actually shielding the machines from, uh, from actually being uh, presented publicly uh, with the vulnerabilities. Something that is very important in cybersecurity to have in mind is that you do not have time to correct the mistakes. This is like a wrong marriage. When you marry wrong, you have a very long road to get out from it. So I believe me, I know it. So I'm telling you, when you go wrong, you really, you want, you want to backpedal and it's just, it's better just to continue, you know, when you, you keep, on, keep on going ahead and trying to put the best safeguards that you can in the middle. Those are the type of safeguards that you have to put, and they are next generation. What's going to be next? We have an unclear future about security because we have too many solutions. We have too many container solutions, too many orchestration solutions, too many platforms, and there is not enough vendors and not enough uh, open source effort to fix it, especially in the next generation side. What we need to look for is the creation or, or the, the appearance of a fully fledged open source security solution that will help us, uh, not only from the commercial side, but also from the open source, to have the elements that I have stated here. Anti-malware, IPS protection, intrusion prevention system, and web reputation is a mandatory element in every container ecosystem. That's mandatory. If you don't do that, you're doing it wrong. Behavior monitoring is a necessary component to control the behavior of the uh, runtime, the behavior of the runtime of the containers, not the content, how it behaves. It's already available and it's necessary, but it's not mandatory. Machine learning and artificial intelligence providing detections of activities that we don't have uh, a previous understanding is optional. We are waiting for solutions to appear in the market properly. And sandboxing means that when I have a content inside my container, a file, a library, an executable, and before having it running, I want to take that and put it into a sandbox, detonate the, uh, the, the object, and see the behavior. Thanks, we have it already. It's highly, highly desirable, and it is already available. For me, the uh, ecosystem is too sparse. Nothing wrong with uh, CNCF, eh? all is good. It's just that too many people developing too many solutions, too many people want to be in the top of the mountain. And when you see the CNCF brochure, uh, if you print it on A4, you can't even see the names. You need like an A0 to actually read it properly. There is too much and we need to try to start getting priorities in cybersecurity and aligning the existing real cybersecurity threats with solutions that can fight them. I presented some of you, some of those uh, threats to you, and I presented um, uh, some of the solutions that you can take. After that, thank you very much for listening. I know it took me a little bit more than usual. And uh, if you have any questions, here I am. Now I think that somebody has to hand over. Um, there is a question for you, in fact, from the chat. So have we got a Magic Quadrant Gartner style or another recommended report for container security, which lists the best options? In, uh, I, can, I can send you that. 
Uh, so that was from Kana. So actually, so, if you can so put what, it in what the answer, chat. we'll answer to that question quickly. Uh, at the moment, there would be not that 100% uh, a magic quadrant from Garner. What it, we, it will be is uh, vendors that are actually at the top of this uh, quadrant, which they have, apart from multiple solutions, solution for container security. Good. Cool. Does anybody else have any other questions? You have another question, you said? Uh, just that one, I think. I mean, but yeah, if you have any other questions, if anybody has any questions, please use the, the Zoom chat or YouTube chat to put them in and we'll pass them on. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. I really appreciate that. It was really, really interesting. So thank you so much. Um, we thank you very can much. hand over to the next speaker. So yes. if you would like to stop, stop sharing the screen. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. And Cedric, over to you. Yeah, I should start sharing. Cool. Yeah, looks good. All right. Let me go back. Okay, I will keep like that. Put you in small. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, I will talk to you about Apache Cassandra and how to deploy it in Kubernetes. So I'm Cedric Lundven. I'm a director of developer advocacy uh, at DataStax. I saw some developer advocates out there, so hi, the crew. Uh, this is my day job, and I also have a secret life. So uh, seven years ago, I've created uh, and still maintaining a framework called FF4J, fit your flag for Java, and I'm quite the Java and Spring dinosaur here. So just a shameless plug, because fit your uh, flag for Java is all about uh, CI, CD, I just show you that you import the library in your Java code and the framework will generate for you a web UI where you can enable and disable your features at runtime, no restart. Uh, we handle quite a bunch of databases technologies. And you know, because we are there to analyze what you are doing with your features, if it's up, if it's down, we are able to provide you a nice dashboard to see what, which are the features you use the, the most and when. And that's pretty neat because it's part of the, the framework itself. And you know you can deliver your new app with all the feature flag off, switch on, see that if, if it's working and if it's not, you just switch off. You don't have to roll back. Okay, that was my shameless plug. Let's move forward. Okay, so today is all about putting Cassandra into Kubernetes. So I see in the beginning in the poll that some of you know the concept, uh, not all. So I think I would take a few minutes just to remind everybody what is Cassandra architectures and as a consequence, which are the good use case. Not trying to sell it, to, to go in selling mode is really, this is how it works. And this is why I think this is a good use case. And that's it then see uh, how you can put that in containers and of course move to Kubernetes. Okay, let's get started. So Cassandra is a NoSQL distributed database created 10 years ago. You can install Cassandra on a single node and in there we put about one terabyte of data and 3000 transactions per second and per core. This is the Abacus. You can put more, Cassandra won't stop you but here you will slow down. It's a recommended capacity for a node, but it's distributed. So of course we expect you to work with multiple nodes and those nodes communicate to each other with a, a protocol you, called gossiping. There is no master, it's peer to peer. Okay. The nodes can be grouped, logically grouping as something called a ring or a data center. All those keywords are important to understand to see how we can put that into KTS, Kubernetes. All right, so with this ring, well, the main idea is to say that stuff scale linearly. You need more capacity, add new nodes. You need more throughput, add new nodes. 
This is a benchmark, you all technical audience. So you know that we can uh, make a benchmark to, to tell everything that we need. <laughs> this is the reason why I hide the others database names. I mean, uh, never mind. The, the, the key here is to see that it scale linearly, add new nodes and it will scale. And this is the reason why uh, the biggest uh, user out there are the web giants. So uh, Ape, Apple is very famous to, to have deployed something like 175,000 uh, nodes. And you know Instagram is at more than 100,000 nodes, not on the same cluster, but that's still dozens of petabytes uh, online answering live. Okay, so data is distributed in that in Cassandra, you put some tables. Okay, there is a schema, there is a table, and one of the column in your tables is called a partition key. And the data is distributed among the nodes based on the partition key. And this is the reason why select star from the table is not a good idea with Cassandra because you do a full scan of your uh, ring and it could take some time. The more nodes you add, the slower. And the idea is there when you design your table, uh, you need to know the query, the request before designing. And you would put the red column in the where clause. In this way, you go to the proper node, get all the data you need, get back with the result you've done. And this is how you design and how you go fast with Cassandra. Okay. So this is your ring. Each node is in charge of a range of value. This is what we call a token range. And as a client, you can ask any of the node, no master, remember, this node become the coordinator node for the request and we'll send the data to the replica node, which is in charge of the data, because here it was not owner of this data because it's not part of his token range. So data is distributed. Data is also replicated. And for that, we are using uh, something called the replication factor. How many times does the data is replicated? Here, if I say three times, when I come with my data and want to write my data into Cassandra, it will be written three times in three replica. So with that, data is replicated, data is distributed, and there is no master. Well, it simply means that you can lose any of the node. It's not a big deal. What will happen? The data will be written in the two remaining nodes, and the coordinator node for the request will store the data on disk, and when the node goes back online, we will stream everything that that node missed. And this is a self-healing mechanism in Cassandra. So second range of use case for Cassandra, self-healing, no data loss available all the time. And the reason is the system is still responding if you lose any of the node. All right, let's move forward. This one is neat, especially for this meetup. So you can have multiple ring in a Cassandra cluster. It's not a single one. And so you can read and write from any nodes and the data will be replicated. There is something called a key space inside Cassandra database where you define uh, how many times that my data is replicated and where. So you can have some key space, you know, GDPR only based in EMEA and some key space available across the, the world. And you know, any repositories, market data, anybody? something that should be available everywhere with low latencies, yeah, it's out of the box. Which is true for geographic uh, distribution, it's also true to do hybrid and multi-cloud. What if you would have the same database available everywhere on multi-cloud multi and on-premise, okay? Cassandra is available as simple uh, a tarball uh, on any marketplace, uh, easy to install, so it's not difficult to have a new data center in one. Uh, cloud, and you can expand an existing uh, cluster by adding a new one. So it's not magic, okay? Seems magic with errors. You still need to do VPC peering if you do uh, cloud to cloud. Those nodes still have to communicate. But if the bandwidth is not great, you know, working on the one, it's not a big deal because all the replication are in synchronous. And this is you when you insert something in Cassandra that you yeah, that said. How many nodes should have been updated until I can acknowledge my client that, okay, it's fine, the data has been written. 
Is it only one node? Is it only the node in the local ring? Is it all the nodes? You choose. This is what we call the consistency level. And it all uh, relies to the famous CAP theorem in the distributed system. You cannot achieve the three. And so if you understood what I said until now, as you can lose any of the node, it's available. And as there is no master, is partition tolerant. So the default behavior is AP. But by configuration for each request, you can go to a more consistency. Let's say I write the data and I said per request, I want the maximum consistency. Then I will need to wait that all the nodes holding the replica have been updated to get my allonagement. Okay, I'm very consistent among the nodes. But then if I lose any of the nodes, the request will fail. And so you are not available anymore. And this is what we say that Cassandra is tunable, add tunable consistency. So with the, um, with the consistency level, just there is a trick. To be immediate consistent, uh, you should have your consistency level when you read and the consistency level when you write should be bigger. When you do the sum, it should be bigger than the replication factor. So if I write with quorum, I mean majority of the node, two over three, because my replication factor is three. And I update the two nodes on top with the check mark. And then later on, I read, or not later on, but at the same time, I read the data and also provide the consistency level quorum. And no luck, instead of picking the two nodes above, I, I pick one, or one of the nodes very uh, at the bottom and the other with the check mark. Then um, the coordinator node will get two different values. One is updated, one is uh, outdated when the last write always win and the client go back with the proper last updated value. And this is where this formula come from. So even with this distributed system, you can achieve immediate consistency, but it's not acid. Uh, we are dealing with uh, distributed things here. So I went fast. This meeting is all about uh, Kubernetes, but still, with everything that I said to you, this is the use case where I see Cassandra. First, if you want to leverage on the scalability and have high throughput as volume, this is wherever you can find AV writes and AV reads. So which are these use case? Event streaming, internet of things, log analytics, time series. This is probably where you have heard about Cassandra and why? The reason is there is a heavy read, every, every write uh, requirement here. And Cassandra can cope with that. Second is all about availability. Remember, always on, no data loss. You can do rolling, upgrade, shut down a node, change something, and put it back. So for that, I mean, a lot of use cases. I put some here, caching, market data, printing, inventory, but I mean, most of customer facing, a use case with real time and no downtime should fit here, I guess. Third is the distributed uh, capability and maybe also the web giant like uh, Apple, Instagram, Uber using Cassandra for that. They can have rings all over the world and they can read and write from everywhere and the data is replicated everywhere. So I put also GDPR, you want to have your own a ring in your own country due to the law. Uh, but again, with having nodes all across the world could reduce the latency and you can do some tracking, logistic, improve the customer experience. And so you will love the last one, cloud native. All right, so it's all about uh, building modern applications. So as you can see, Cassandra is all about scaling out working mostly on commodity hardware. It's not about scaling up and providing CPU, RAM. Uh, and the reason is we like to scale out and uh, distributed more and more the data, distributed the load. And you can lose any of the node. So working very well on any cloud, to be honest, because yeah, you can lose any node for you know disk, uh, ben bandwidth, network, CPU. Everything is multi-tenant out there, so you don't know what will fail, but at some point it will fail. 
So if you build your database that <clears throat> match those requirements, you're good to go. You can lose any of the node. Okay, that's it for me selling Cassandra, but that's, I still you see the use case I foresee. All right. So now if we want to put that Cassandra into containers, well, of course, uh, the, the Docker image existing for ages. Uh, and as a Docker image, you have to provide uh, tons of extra parameters for environment variables to set up the network, to export all the ports you need. So uh, gossiping communication, client communication, all the security, all the, you know, I think there are about five to 10 ports to open to, to fully be able to uh, use Cassandra on Docker. And of course, it's a stateful, uh, it's a database, so it's stateful. Uh, so you need to uh, provide some volumes and you know, just to not to lose your data when you restart, that makes sense. So that seems a bit, uh, a lot of parameters, but nothing very special about it. So what you want to do with that, you want to use Docker Compose, okay. So if I use Docker Compose, then you start seeing something. Okay, so in Docker Compose, you need to split what is a Cassandra seed, which are the first nodes in your cluster. There is no master, but still some nodes, some nodes are called seeds. And this is a starting node when you start building your, your cluster. Then when a new node join the ring, you need to provide a list of seed providing their IP uh, to be able to, for the node to join, get the topology of the ring and you know, be able to be part of the ring. So scaling uh, ring and Cassandra in only Docker Compose, not good enough. First, you cannot, that's Cassandra rule. You cannot add multiple nodes at a time you need to wait a few uh, seconds. Uh, there is a two minute rules to add a new node to a Cassandra ring. And the reason is each time there is a new node joining in the ring, then that guy need to stream uh, data to him just to reshuffle the token uh, in all the nodes to have a, a balance uh, data among all the nodes. So we can do the trick to wait and do some Docker endpoint SH, uh, seeing if uh, the node is ready to, the, the ring is ready to add a new node, but that's not ideal, right? You would like to be able to fully automate this, uh, uh, this behavior. And let's see how you can do that in Kubernetes. All right. Okay, so you are a Kubernetes expert. I won't explain you what is Kubernetes. Uh, all right, so this is the plane, the control plane, and here you do have uh, workers, node and minion. And in a pod, of course, you do have multiple containers. That's important, it's what will what we'll change, what, what will explain them when I need to put Cassandra in there. Okay, so, um, Best practice, obviously, is to create your namespace when you uh, will create a Cassandra cluster inside uh, Kubernetes. And here, everywhere, I will use cas-operator. And let's see what we'll put in there. Okay, first, it's a stateful application. And I think last month, you have a talk uh, about uh, exactly what is a stateful app in Kubernetes. So, we need persistent volume to store the data, to store the data, you know, like volume for Docker. And wherever you will define uh, your kube cluster, you need to use a proper implementation, the storage class, based on uh, which environment you run. Is it on premise or any cloud provider? You will need to provide a different storage class. You know, are you using some block storage EBS? Uh, are you using some fast disk or a mechanical disk? It's not mechanical, it's 2020. Uh, but yeah, you will define your spec band as a storage class, okay? And the second uh, resource important in Kube uh, about the stateful is the stateful set. You know, with replica set, you have stateless 
pods running and if one pod goes down, then the control manager will detect that the state is not what you expect and will you know, ask the scheduler to spawn a new pod matching the state. Well, in stateful set, you do not want that when you shut down uh, a pod, it will recreate it because, hey, what about the data now? And so for those, we are using stateful set. So each time uh, we, the stateful set would create a pod, you will have an attached storage using persistence volume. I will use my storage class to instantiate a persistent volume for this pod. And I will use persistent volume claim to attach my pod to my volume. Nothing uh, special about Cassandra here. This is just how it works. And my purpose now is to match concept from Cassandra to those concepts and see how uh, we have designed the Cassandra operator to make it work with this. Okay, two last resources uh, to get to, 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 to remind you. So first is the custom resources. So we need to have our own specification, our own resource. And for that, we create a custom resource uh, defining a spec like that. So uh, it's called a Cassandra data center. <clears throat> All right, okay. <clears throat> and we do have an operator monitoring this CRD for us, monitoring all the events coming through. And this is the operator that will really act on what needs to be done in our CRD. Cassandra has some rules. I told you, you cannot immediately add a new node. You need to wait for the node to bootstrap, but there are a lot of uh, monitoring and administration tasks to perform on the Cassandra node that need a proper orchestration. And the operator is there to do that. And I've prepared for you some nice slide to explain that into much details. Okay, and now let's move to cast operator. Yeah, I put back this slide just to give you, uh, so the Cassandra cluster is the overall. I told you that already. In a Cassandra cluster, you can have multiple rings. Okay, I already told you about that. The small, the dot, the orange dot are the nodes, Cassandra nodes. Okay, um, last, I did not talk about the rack. And Rack is uh, telling Cassandra that those two nodes have some affinities. Those two nodes, you know, are on the same uh, physical data center, for instance, or the same AZ availability zone if you're running in AWS. So with that, Cassandra knows that when it will, you know, distribute the data among a ring, it's not a good practice to put the same replica in the same rack. Because if you lose the rack, probably you will lose multiple replica. So once that's possible, Cassandra will uh, distribute the, the replica in a way that they are, two are not in the, in the same rack, if possible, or at least uh, introduce as less affinity as possible uh, among those nodes. Okay, and with these terms, we are all set. Your mission, should you choose it to accept, is to put that dot into Kubit with an operator. All right. Finally, we get it. All right. So <clears throat> the Cassandra operators will do all the tasks you need to start a ring and do the operation on it. So seed management, you saw before with Docker Compose that it's not that easy. And we do have one per rack or three per data center, which depend which is the, 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 the more. Uh, you will define, we will define a CRD, Cassandra data center. So we define a CRD per ring. And so in the CAS operator, you can have, you can handle a multi ring um, cluster, of course. And it will do the rolling reboot of the node, store the data in rack safe way, scale up rack when you need to, replace dead and uncovered nodes, getting back the data if you need to, and as I told you, yield multi DC. So how does it work? Again, I put stuff into many details for you. 
I know you're the expert. Okay, <laughs> so um, when I install a CAS operator using either the YAML or the uh, Helm recipe, now we provide both. And of course, the new recommended path is to use Helm, at least to have versioning and to proper only you know, migration and stuff like that. We used to have only YAML deployment file. Now it's a proper Helm recipe. So you will define some security. Of course, it's uh, secure, uh, not with the nice tools that we have just shown in the talk before, but at least you do have the config map and all the, the, the claims ready. Uh, for you, user, oper administrator of your, of your cluster. And you need to define a server storage, a storage class. And I named it server storage. Either you know, this, it will evolve based on the kube server you are running. I told you that. Okay, so this is my CRD. Can I put you in small like that? Okay, so this is our CRD. As you can see in the spec, you will define which version of Cassandra you need to run. Uh, so here it's OSS Cassandra, can be data stacks enterprise, uh, but working well with OSS. You will define the name of your ring. Here I will say DC1, the size, okay, the storage class you want to use, access right once, the storage, and um, Cassandra is set up with a file called cassandra-yaml and you can override any key by providing the config like that. Uh, with, Docker, you, with Docker image only, you can al also override uh, cassandra-yaml key but using environment variables. But here you can you know, use a config not only to override cassandra-yaml but also the GVM option. So this... Um, I will, uh, in my next slide, I will just show how the cluster has evolved executing this YAML, applying this YAML. But I also provide you another one, which is, I told you that we are rack aware and you can simply provide the rack uh, key in the, in the setting, in the specification, just to start uh, splitting your uh, stateful set. So there is one stateful set per rack. Okay, so you will distribute your stateful set in one rack like that. So here adding the rack notion on top of what I've shown you before. And so if I deploy a single node and inside the single DC, this is what it would like. We create some services for um, the seed service, the all pod services. I do have a CRD for each data center, the secret associated for this CRD. Single rack, so I will create a single STS, so cluster one, name of the cluster, DC one, name of the CRD, default, because I didn't provide any rack, STS, okay, stateful set. Uh, and I do have a single node. So my Cassandra node is a pod where I will provide, of course, a persistent volume uh, instantiating the server storage. And now, if I took this file and I only update size to three, so I reapplying the same file, just only changing the size to three, this is where all the magic of the operator uh, happen. It detects the change, and now we need to provide two more uh, nodes in our ring. And we need to apply all the rules. Do the first, wait until the first is done, go back to the second one and so forth and so forth. And so inside the pod, you need also to have a bit of intelligence to tell Kubernetes that, okay, this pod is uh, you know, ready or not. And we need to re-implement the uh, liveness uh, probe and the readiness probe. So let's apply the size equals three to this cluster. And this is what it looks like. Now I simply have adding two more pods and with the name STS-01 and two, and only with the name you can totally understand how it works. And with that, you can see that you can run multi-DC cluster um, with the operator. So now what about the pod? Well, inside the pod, of course you do have Cassandra. 
but Cassandra itself, you know, it's uh, there is a GVM. You can uh, you can act, you can interact with the GVM using um, using some uh, GMX and stuff. But yeah, you want to have an API to be able to do the liveness and readiness curve. And so at DataStacks, we have created and open sourced the uh, REST API management API for Apache Cassandra. Again, it's just a proposal. Now DataStax open source more and more content and propose to the community. It's not, again, a way to force people. There are multiple operators uh, for Cassandra out there. Insta cluster create one. Um, Orange in France also created one. And the idea is to have one operator in uh, Apache Cassandra 4.0, where the beta version will be ready and make the gap before the summer. So this is a proposal to have your management API for Cassandra. It's open source. You do have the link. Um, and this is the sidecar deployed as a sidecar inside the pod just to provide a REST API on top of a running Cassandra node. All right. And with that, I'm done. So um, last slide, I, in my team, we are running Cassandra Developer Workshop every single Wednesday. Uh, so we, we just finished one before going to the day today. Uh, and each time we're addressing a new content uh, around Cassandra. And we will do the next ends on about deploying Cassandra in Kubernetes using what I show you uh, next week on Thursday. So you can totally register. You get here the, the QR code. Uh, I will share the link with you uh, later. It's totally free. And you know what? You don't have to install anything. We can uh, run with Katakoda scenario for you, or of course, in the repo I show you there, you can go, go there now, GitHub Data Stacks Academy, Kubernetes Workshop Online. You do have the command to pass command after command, YAML after YAML. Uh, you will simply have to have, uh, of course, a Kubernetes um, uh, cluster running. And we would advise you to use kind, because in, with the kind uh, implementation of the cluster, you can run on-premise and can have one master and multiple worker. And as there is one um, Cassandra node per worker, by default, it's worked uh, much better like that. All right. So again, I'm talking, uh, I'm here to give you a lot of free stuff today. So um, Jeffrey Carpenter have released the third version of the Cassandra book or Ray book, Cassandra, the definitive guide. You go to this link, those QR code, you get the ebook for free. Okay, it's a 400 page for you. Uh, go for it, learn Cassandra, we love it. Uh, but I think I would share the slide with everyone on Slack and everywhere after. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cedric. Um, that was super awesome. Uh, Danny asked the question, is there a Helm chart for Cassandra? Yes, there is. Yeah, yeah, there is. Maybe you could elaborate like why you use the Helm chart over the operator or the other way around? Mm. No, I, 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 I could, I need to take the question online. I'm not really sure the, the, the Helm is very new and I'm only know about uh, until now to handle versioning and migration path. It was a bit tricky and Helm helped with that. Cool, awesome. And some people are asking for the links. I think you, you mentioned- Yes, also. so yeah, so we will move to, to, to pause and I will share the link on the chat and also on the Slack room, I guess, and also on the YouTube chat and everybody will be happy. But yeah, yeah for the YouTube chat, okay. you would have to do it. <laughs> Yep, perfect. And uh, we'll have the blog post afterwards, so you can also get the same resources there, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. Perfect. Um, any other questions for Cedric? Okay.
I guess not. So thank you very, very much, Cedric. I really appreciate you coming to speak. And with that, we're going to go to a break and a very special, special performance. So I'm looking for Kuzo. Hi. Hello. Hello. Oh, wait. I, stage is all yours. I don't know why I volunteered for this. I only just then realized later that it's going to be live and preserved forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be awesome. It's it's cool. It's just a just a friendly chat. I'm really looking forward to this. Oh gosh, I'm not that good. I haven't practiced in ages, but yeah, we'll do something. So feel free to mute me if I'm terrible. <laughs> can you can you hear that? Okay. Perfect. Okay, so this is the song which you might know from the 90s, uh, More Than Words. It's not in the right tuning though, because I don't want to tune my guitar again for the next song. So I thought I'll just do it in an easier tuning. And I have, my, I have tuned my guitar, maybe out of tune, I apologize, but I have tuned it just now. First one. All right. <laughs> okay. Amazing. Uh, I guess people know the song Everybody Hurts by REM. Someone sing. <laughs> that would be great. I think Joel is singing without his.
much time do I have left? Ages. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I did fast car early, but there isn't much to fast car because it's just you need someone to sing it. It's a lot of this. Chorus. People don't know this song. It's a passenger song called Whispers. And passenger is um, it's just one guy, Mike from Brighton. It's a really nice song if you have the lyrics. So it's not going to make much sense without the lyrics. That's it. I did get my electric guitar out because I didn't know, I don't know enough acoustic songs. So let me see if I can do something on the electric. Nah. This is gonna be mostly heavy metal though, <laughs> which you may not like. <laughs> I don't think you can see the, they can't. You hear that okay? Yeah, this is amazing. Let's see how this goes. So I did tune this ages ago. Should be in tune. So this is an interesting trick that Black Sabbath used at the beginning of this song. You will recognize the song if I do this. It's not on any of the frets. It's actually on the headstock where if you do where if you press down on this string and you play. A lot of people recognize this because it's in many, it's in many advertisements and uh, yeah, TV series and stuff like that. It's basically, it's Iron Man by Black Sabbath. So I'll just play the whole thing. Oops. <laughs> 
That's basically the whole song and it keeps going in, it just keeps on going in variations on that. Um, people probably know Enter Sandman by Metallica. I don't have a pedal, so let's just do this. That's basically that song. Um, People know that one? No? I'm not sure. Nirvana, smells like teen spirit. There you go. So that song has that part and then this. And then the solo is. by Motorhead. It's all metal. You got a request for red hot chili peppers, if you know any. I haven't learned chili peppers yet. I need to learn chili peppers. It feels appropriate to play Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> <laughs> With all the riots going on. Someone also requested Rush. I don't, don't know. know if you know any songs from Rush. Whoever requested that, unfortunately, I'm not a fan of Rush. 
And they're gonna be angry. Uh, yeah, they're gonna be angry at me saying I'm a bad brush. <laughs> well, a request for ACDC. Yeah, I'm not good at ACDC. This is the trickiest part. So, not that good at a CDC. And I forgot how to play Highway to Hell. Highway to Hell is an easy, easy one to play. I forgot how to play it. Rage Against the Machine once. I think I'm out. <laughs> Someone, one last person asked about Metallica. Everybody loves this. Everybody loves you playing. I think if it wasn't for the fact that Stefan has to talk, we could just happily sit here and listen to you. So now that I'm finished, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, Amazing. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Especially with no, uh, not much time to pre prepare or practice to just volunteer to play yeah. for us. I, uh, Amazing, I love it. Thank you so much. Actually, you asked me to play. It wasn't me. I, th I think you, you hinted at it and I was like, yes, definitely. It's the best thing ever. Thank you. It's awesome. Thank you so yeah. much. Well, All right, on. I think we are ready to hand over to our third speaker of the evening and learn more about cloud native and kubernetes so stefan 
Over to you to share your screen. Let's go. Let me share my screen. And the correct presentation. All right. Is it OK for all of you? Looks good. Cool. So um, uh, this talk will be um, about um, uh, the key steps to um, obtain a better quality uh, infra, to infra as code um, based on Terraform. And basically, I'm Stefan Jodon. I've been doing operations for the past 20 years. Um, I co-founded a couple of um, tech companies in Canada and Europe, and a sound studio totally unrelated. And I wrote a book about infra as code uh, here in the UK. So um, I'm the CTO uh, at CloudSkiff, and we aim to um, propose a, a platform for uh, developers uh, to um, work as a team and improve um, their code and collaboration um, all online in, in seconds. So the beta is uh, up there. If you want to try, it's free. So um, to improve your um, code quality, there is a lot of um, tools around here. Um, there is a lot of uh, talks um, to improve your quality. A lot of them are quite hard or difficult to use. Um, I wanted, as it is a very short talk, um, to offer um, a few tools that I found, find sorry, are really useful uh, and that can be used in minutes uh, for you. So um, the agenda is very uh, quick. Um, Terraform is um, it's going to be a quick presentation about Terraform, which is min minimalist in the testing area. And then we're going to cover some basics, uh, how to create an environment, uh, correct environment for your testing. And then we're going to talk about static analysis, uh, two tools that I really like, you'll see. And then we're going to go a bit further with some um, um, compliance checks uh, during the Terraform planning phase. And in the end, um, we're going to check uh, validation for the reality of what we deployed using InSpec. So um, to, uh, I have all the code um, and ready to use, but I, I thought it was maybe better um, just to have screenshots and talk about it instead of just playing with my laptop uh, for the whole talk. So um, basically, um, so I'm not sure everybody is um, uh, familiar with Terraform, but basically Terraform works with providers for each cloud provider and has resources. And this is basically an instance um, to launch. So you describe what you want. Um, so there is a sub um in Terraform, it's, which is called named uh, validate. And Terraform validates only uh, for structure and coherence, which means that um, this obviously bad um, code um, will validate against Terraform. So it means that buggers, buggers, one, two, three, four, and buggers uh, will um, be perfectly right in the eyes of Terraform. So um, the only way Terraform validate will be useful for you is if you request a bad resource or if you request um, you make a typo in a variable or that kind of things. So it's really not useful to improve the quality of your code or the security of your code. So that was the first um, introduction to the existing um, uh, features for, um, for that in, in, inside Terraform. The second part, um, uh, the second part, sorry, of um, the basics uh, I wanted to cover is um, the, Terraform config, um, the Terraform version. So a developer builds um, uh, his code based on um, a specific version. And in this case, uh, Terraform um, added some um, features like support for Tencent cloud storage uh, or trim functions. What about um, if you do, if you put all that test, oh, put, oh, sorry, if you put all the tests uh, in the CI CD system and you do, do not have the correct version of Terraform, it's going to fail while your code is perfectly correct. So um, it's uh, really useful uh, to have a tool named TFENV. So it's uh, inspired by RBENV for all your um, all the Ruby users around that know the tool. So basically, 
the base um, tool you need to ensure that you are testing the correct um, um, the, the correct code using the correct version of Terraform um, is by using that kind of tool because um, managing dozens of versions in your CI CD system is a pain um, and managing them by hand or, or with Docker is, um, well, it's, it's just a loss of time. So that's the very basics um, for covering uh, the quality of your code, which means it doesn't improve the quality of the code. It just brings a standard uh, ability to test. So the quality that it brings is that you can have, uh, uh, you can start building a matrix slowly of the rough versions um, for your code, like probably your old customer that you do not talk about anymore uh, is using a very old version and your production is a bit um, earlier than uh, the, the development environment or the staging environment. So uh, this is TFN. It's the first tool um, that I really uh, advise you to use uh, and integrate in your CI CD system. It's called TFN by TF Utils account on GitHub. Um, so now let's dive uh, directly to the real tools for tonight, uh, which are um, uh, to begin with statics checks. Uh, TF Lint is the first tool I really like. So if we take our first example here. Uh, so we request a bogus AMI with a bogus instance type with obviously a highly unlikely security group ID, etc. So TF Lint, if you do not do anything um, uh, and just execute it, will statically analyze your code and we'll see that instance type is, bug is not valid. So um, it doesn't cover everything, but just by doing nothing, you will already have a, an improvement. So you may have a, a typo. Um, you may have, maybe you, you mismatch something, I don't know. But at least you get that uh, instantaneously. But TFLint does a lot more. TFLint um, can go away um, after just the, the static test. Um, it can ask the AWS API. It has a deep check, so it can um, ask your um, using your credentials, the AWS API, if the AMI, your request does exist. Uh, same for the security group ID. Maybe the security group ID does exist, but not in your account. And in this case, your code is perfectly correct, but you, know that you do not have the right to use it. So you start um, with using that kind of tool, you can start um, uh, improving the quality of your code because you will not uh, push and um, apply stuff that um, is that seems correct, but is in fact not usable or um, uh, painfully wrong in production. Um, another thing that TFLin can do um, is uh, to help you with reviews, like uh, probably you are doing pull requests to review your infra code. And in this case, uh, let's say someone in your team requested a T1 micro. So what you uh, as a reviewer would probably suggest your uh, coworker is T1 is a bit old. Prob probably you do not want to use a T1 micro. The, um, the performances are terrible and uh, the cost is higher than a T3 micro today. Please change your um, instance type. That's, um, that's a lot of, um, uh, I'm sorry, there is a lot of um, uh, thunderstorms here. <laughs> if you hear them, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, uh, the, the tool here will do it uh, automatically for you. So uh, directly on, on, if you insert this tool, TFLint, uh, directly on the, um, um, on the pull request on the CI CD system, uh, it will save you a lot of time like this. Uh, it can enforce as well best practices because uh, let's say, um, you know, in Terraform, you can type your variables. So you can say my variable is a string, a, is a Boolean, is a, an array, and you can have descriptions, you can have a lot of things. Um, it's probably your role as a reviewer to check for uh, variables, uh, types, and descriptions and say, hello, you, did, you, you, forgot your, uh, you forgot to type your variable, you should type it, et cetera. So same here, um, you can enforce that directly uh, from the pull request and have best practices directly enforced um, um, using uh, TFLint um, as a, an enforcement for best practices. It's quick, it just takes seconds. So, and you already have value 
from something um, uh, that was uh, quite easy to, uh, to, to deploy for you. TFLint works with a lot of things um, from Terraform directly, configuration requirements, pinned versions, that kind of things. Uh, AWS and Azure, Azure is through plug plugin, sorry, GCP is coming soon. And uh, hopefully, I hope uh, more is to come because it's a really cool tool with the deep uh, analysis system. So um, you can find um, Terraform uh, TFLint from this account on GitHub. And it's uh, really cool. I highly encourage you to add this tool uh, to your um, CI CD system for, for requests. The second uh, tool uh, I want to cover is TFSEC. Um, it's still static checks um, like TFLint, but the focus is more on security issues. Um, there is different tools and different approaches um, for that kind of um, 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 features. Um, there is Fugue, there is Checkoff, there is a lot of different tools uh, that check things uh, differently at different steps. Uh, I like this one because it's very early in the process. Um, so probably you want to check um, for issues um, very early. Sorry for my slides. So let's say you have someone in your team, once again, uh, making a pull request and saying, okay, here's my secret key, or I have a variable named password and it has default value. Probably you would uh, make a comment in this pull request and say, mm, are you sure? And um, problem solved with a tool like TFSEC, it's gonna do the job for you. So the user, your developer will have feedback immediately uh, directly on, on the pull request. So, um, you will gain a lot of time and the code will improve by itself and your developer will learn on a job uh, just by getting feedback, not from you, but from uh, tools that enforce uh, what you anyway wanted uh, in the end. But for a more complex example, uh, let's say that uh, I don't know how to create an AWS uh, an S3 bucket. So I ask it on Reddit and Reddit gives me four lines that perfectly work. So. Uh, I, I send them to my pull request and my boss just reads the pull request and say, oh my God, Stefan, you just created a, a, a bucket with public red write. Why did you find this code on Reddit? Okay, so um, instead of um, just doing this, you could have um, feedback directly from TFSEC that would say it, oh my God, you have an ACL that um, allows public uh, red access. So um, same here, very obvious uh, mistakes can be corrected directly, uh, just right at the pull request stage. Um, I would even put it earlier directly on the, on the developer laptop, but you can hardly uh, force developers to, to configure their uh, own uh, pre-commit hooks on, on their own laptops. So it's quite cool, but that's the easy part. Um, what about logging? I just discovered that S3 had logging enabled. I, I did not know. I did not know that I could uh, encrypt um, objects in my S3 buckets. So right now I started with only three lines and I end up with uh, properly secured. And uh, now I know that I have some logging for S3 and on, on the bucket. And I know as well that I can encrypt my um, configuration. So once again, in just a couple of seconds, you add a lot of value and your developer learned a lot of, a lot of things because now he's not gonna make the mistake again. He knows that all those things are uh, available to him. And the next time um, the bucket uh, will be created securely. So TFSEC uh, works uh, for um, Terraform. It, create, it checks a lot of things in it, uh, AWS, Azure, and GCP. I hope uh, as well that more um, clouds will be um, covered. But for now, that's the three, uh, that's the three of them. So it's available at LiMG um, accounts um, on GitHub. So now we, we talked about uh, the initial steps, um, very static uh, analysis, and um, we got a bit further um, with TFLint uh, by asking the API for um, real IDs, checks for reality, et cetera. So um, if you're familiar with Terraform, after this uh, analysis um, uh, step, you have the planning phase. The planning phase basically, just um, creates all your code and creates a diff 
um, and checks um, uh, against a um, the AWS API for um, what you are supposed to create. So let's say you wanted to create a new S3 bucket in this case, and you don't have it, then it's gonna make a plan to create it. And you review the plan and then you apply that plan to create that uh, S3 bucket. So at this stage, um, you might want to uh, uh, en ensure and force some compliance. And this uh, tool is uh, creatively named uh, Terraform Compliance. So, um, if you're not familiar with uh, the Cucumber um, BDD, Behavior Driven Development um, uh, Structure, so you have uh, a features name, you have a scenario, and you have conditions uh, given, blah, 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 you, um, you uh, are expected to have this uh, result. And this is executed in the background by, um, uh, by some code. And, and then you have some results. That's very useful um, to make some, well, to code using the BDD um, system. But in this case, it's not used for BDD, it's used uh, for uh, compliance uh, using uh, natural language. So in our case, uh, if we take the previous example, uh, I could have written something like that and it would have been perfectly um, supported by um, um, Terraform compliance against the plan. So it's not useful in this case for, uh, that's straight from the documentation. It's not useful for the demonstration tonight because it's already taken care of by the previous tool earlier in, in, in the process. So um, in our case, uh, we created this bucket, but we didn't create a tag. Let's say our security guys, uh, I don't know, your boss, anyone, uh, says it's very important that all our resources have tags. So we can write something very easy like this scenario, ensure all resources have tags given blah, 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 blah. And tags must not be null. Why? Because you can create a tag with a variable, but what about, it, it's, it works all the way uh, through the previous steps, but not just this one, because maybe the variable um, uh, went wrong. Maybe um, it was supposed to be a number, it ended up being null. That kind of thing. So uh, during the planning phase, there is some computation, and the computation um, can go wrong. So that compliance check during the planning phase is very important because it adds some value. Now things are computed, not just statically analyzed. So in this case, it's going to fail. So you have a feedback. So put that in your CI CD system once again during um, um, in the pull request, so you can have uh, a much better um, view on what uh, um, your code is really doing um, compliance wise. So once uh, now it's checked and oh, it's all green, cool. So uh, Terraform compliance unfortunately works only for AWS right now, but there is a lot of ready to use examples. It's really cool. So you can really get started in, in minutes uh, just by um, using the examples they, they, they serve directly on the documentation. Uh, it's obviously security oriented by the, well, all the usual suspects like KMS, et cetera. Um, but there is also cool uh, features like uh, to enforce naming conventions. Probably you want to enforce um, naming for, I don't know, maybe your, um, your country, your continent, your, I don't know, for resources, your customers. Um, so prefixes uh, can be uh, self-documented. And that can, that's the kind of things uh, that can be done. Forbidden resources as well. Uh, let's say you are um, PCI, PCI DSS compliance, and maybe you are just forbidden to use a, a list um, of resources at AWS that are not PCI. And basically it can be done at the compliance level way, way, way before uh, just asking the IAM user on AWS for, um, um, for the, your rights to use uh, resources. So that's, um, that's for uh, Terraform compliance. That's a, a really cool, simple tool um, working using the plan, the Terraform plan. Um, so it's the last phase uh, before um, the execution phase. So it's, it's really cool. Um, there is a lot of tools that go um, before the verification and uh, after the planning phase, it's all the integration tools. Uh, TerraTest is one. It's a very cool tool, but very, very complicated to use. Uh, it's pure Go. 
And basically in a short um, uh, presentation like this, uh, I thought it wasn't um, really useful to show how to do integration tests um, in, in this case, because it's not about quality. Uh, it's just about integration. So there is, I highly encourage you to check um, that tool. It's from the guys at Gruntworks. Uh, it's a really cool tool. It's written in Go. It's usable in Go. It's for integration tests. And now we can skip directly to uh, verification. Um, so the tool is named uh, Inspec. It's from the Chef guys, but it's not related to Chef. Um, it's uh, related to server spec and air spec and what, whatever spec uh, has been around for the past years testing um, server things using R spec. And it's really um, complete, you'll see. And um, why would we need to um, check? Um, uh, why would it, what, sorry, why, why would we need to validate what we just launched? Um, because uh, let's say, um, a lot of things can go wrong uh, the correct way. So let's say we launched a simple EC2 instance in the VPC group, in the VPC, sorry, uh, using a security group with a mix of uh, the usual things like dynamic names and tags, etc. So um, everything went right and it's been tested right, it's been planned right, it's been applied right, but um, what if in, in the whole mix, what if uh, in this code, that's a very simple code that executed it. You can see there is a data source. A data source is simply a request on um, uh, AWS API. You have a global variable. It can be overridden. Um, there is here a, a simple um, lookup, um, internal lookup for another resource on, um, on your chef code, um, sorry, Terraform code. And you have here, here a local value. Etc. So there is a uh, local variable, sorry. There is a lot of um, ways that can look right um, in, in the static analysis, um, in, in the compliance. It can go very, oh, it, it can be really cool, but um, not what you expected. Um, in a way, maybe the, the, the AMI returned exists and is correct, but it's not the one you expected. Uh, maybe this uh, instance type by default was something and uh, let's say T3 small, and maybe uh, you thought it was overridden uh, by your value and it wasn't. So uh, checking for reality is very important. Um, so that's why validation exists. So how does it work? It really uh, is very, it's, it's really simple. It's a simple description and ex, uh, expectations, sorry. And you can inject dynamic content uh, straight from uh, the, ter the Terraform state. And um, so a mix of dynamic uh, information and um, static information like T3 nano versions, strings, uh, booleans or whatever. Um, so it's really readable. It doesn't um, require uh, um, a high level of um, coding skills. It, you can get uh, started very easily. Um, and it brings a lot of value because, well, in this case, uh, it's OK. Um, the, the code was uh, correct. But you see that is a um, auto-generated value. Um, this is a dynamic VPC. Um, that kind of things. That's a lot of um, uh, situations, uh, locations in the code where things could have gone wrong. And now we could check it directly from um, the uh, Terraform state. So if you're not familiar with, the, with what a state is in Terraform, it's the last thing that you get after the apply phase. So once you applied your code, um, uh, on, on, on Terraform, on, on AWS, let's say, you will get back a list of values that you could not know about. Like in, in our case, it's that kind of values. So you can say, I don't know um, what my VPC ID is, but what I want to know is that I use the default one. So in this case, you can just pass um, the, uh, the Terraform state and say, I want to be sure that um, my security group here really runs on the default VPC and I do not know which one is it. 
but now I can get it right from the state. So that's the kind of things you can have um, right from um, uh, Inspec. So uh, Inspec is a really powerful tool um, for that kind of checks for AWS, GCP, Azure, um, DigitalOcean, and much more, I think. And it's um, it has hundreds of checks. Uh, and inside each each check, you can have a, mul uh, a multitude of sub checks for each and every component of your cloud systems. Um, so it's really cool. And you have the same for operating systems. You have hundreds of checks for every kind of Linux flavors you can imagine, and uh, even Windows. So um, yeah, so that's about uh, Inspec. Inspec.io. Uh, it's very easy to use. Uh, it's very complete and um, you can have uh, a lot more, um, a lot of value by checking your um, the result of your uh, applications in 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 production or in your environment. So basically, um, that's it for this talk. The key takeaways are: it's very easy if you are getting started with Terraform, or if you are an experienced user using Terraform to get more value by basically at least uh, using uh, the correct version of Terraform and staying up to date, uh, by linking your code, by checking for security, by improving very easily, very quickly, uh, things that you may not even knew about uh, for uh, hundreds of different, um, different uh, um, resources and cloud providers. I didn't mention that thing that TFLint um, counts the checks it does by hundreds. So it's really cool for that. Um, we mentioned TF compliance as well. Um, it's for checking the plan. So it's a bit later in the process. And in the end, uh, after all the integration tests that we did not cover in this, um, in this talk, uh, we validated our executions uh, using Inspec. So uh, from the chef guys. Um, so basically, that's very easy to put in place. It's, it brings a lot of value, and you really should um, do this. So thank you. And well, you can check cloudskip.com and join our beta as well. And I'm here for questions if you have questions uh, about Terraform and testing and um, all the good practices. Thank you. Thank you so much much that was a fantastic talk really appreciate that um there's a question in the chat so how is TerraTest? and maybe you can give an introduction for people who don't know about TerraTest. um in, uh, uh, you want an introduction to TerraTest? oh just one line what it is uh what it is well basically it's uh it's basically a goal library um and you just include it in your code and you just um, manipulate Terraform programmatically um, using pure Go. So it's highly powerful. You can do absolutely anything you want with it, um, but it's also quite complicated to use uh, as maybe you know uh, other systems like GOS or even um, server spec, uh, chef spec, etc. It's very easy to use because it's quite compact and uh, a lot of things are taken care of for you. In this case, you do everything by yourself. The framework is here to provide you tools uh, using a language. Um, so yeah, the, I, I don't have the, the URL right now, but if you type TerraTest, TerraTest, it's terratest.gruntwork.io. There is a lot of examples. I can put it on the chat, yeah. So, so yeah, awesome. it's very powerful. It's for integration it's testing. It can um, uh, it can even do unit testing. Like if you have a module, uh, just one Terraform module. So a module is like a big function of code for Terraform. So you can say that I don't know. Uh, I have a module to launch uh, multiple um, um, Cassandra uh, clusters. Let's say, and um, so uh, and you want to test uh, different uh, metrics of. Um, um, different uh, versions, I don't know, of Cassandra. Um, you could use it only for specific nodes, as you mentioned, uh, instead of uh, checking for the whole end-to-end integ -end integration uh, test um, in infrastructure, sorry. So yeah, that's the kind of thing you can do with TerraTest, but it's um, 
but it's a lot more it's the subject of a whole talk and there is whole talks uh, done about uh, terror tests on the internet awesome um there's a couple more questions about yeah. this but we're pretty much out of time so maybe you can people can get hold of you on twitter or somewhere sure. else sure yeah awesome no problem. awesome excellent well, I'd like to thank all of our three speakers tonight for giving really excellent talks and for our music break in the middle, which was just super fun and awesome. So thank you so much. And thank you everybody for attending this evening. I'll see you back again in the beginning, the first Wednesday of next month of July. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good evening, wherever you are. Good evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.